somebody say that saved me that saved me and rescued me just a moment hey you set me free somebody say i give you glory glory i give you glory Forever, I give you glory, glory. Come on, put them together. I give you glory, glory. Lord, we love you. I give you glory, glory. Jesus. I give you glory, glory. I give you glory, glory. I give you glory, glory. Jesus. Somebody say, and we'll end with a crown. Forever, I give you glory, glory. Come on, put them together. I give you glory, glory. I give you glory, glory. Jesus. I give you glory, glory. I give you glory, glory. I give you glory, glory. Jesus. One more time, I give you glory, glory. I give you glory, glory. I give you glory, glory. Jesus. Come on and give him some praise this morning. Come on, give him a big shout of praise. Come on, give him some glory this morning. Hallelujah, yeah. Come on, how many remember the day that you were saved? Come on, do you remember the day when he saved you this morning? Put them together. It's in the greatest day, the greatest day. Never 
nothing else will do.
somebody say that with me. Let it rain. for that get out your seat and meet greet and welcome somebody to church let it rain let it Amen. Anybody love him on this Sunday morning? Praise the Lord. It's so good to see you on this Sunday in the presence of the Lord. We're so excited that you're here. And 
and uh, just excited about what God's going to do this morning. We're going to go ahead and pray. We've got several prayer requests we want to lift up this morning that we want to continue to pray for. But if you've got a prayer request that you know God's able to meet, would you slip your hands up high towards heaven together and let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you this morning, Lord, with so many needs and so many requests, but I thank you that you are the one answer, you're the one source. And we lift up our hands to you today, God, believing that you are the healer, that you are a provider, that, God, you are a deliverer and you can make a way where there seems to be no way. And we lift our hands to you today, surrendering, asking you, God, to have your way. Do what it is only you can do. We worship you that you're more than able. We worship you that there is nothing impossible for you, that no matter how bad it looks in the natural, we worship you that you are more than able and believe there is nothing too hard for you. Lord, we pray for every church in this community that lifts up the name of Jesus. Lord, that souls would be saved, that lives would be changed, and we'll give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. For we ask it all in the one wonderful name of Jesus we pray and somebody shout amen amen praise the Lord it's so good to see you on this Sunday uh, summer morning we're so excited that you're here and the way of announcements don't forget if you're a first time visitor or if it's been a while since you've been home to Turning Point there should be a visitor card in the chair in front of you if you can grab that and fill it out and place that in the offering in just a few moments when we receive the offering we're just so excited that you're here and asking the Lord to bless you like only he can don't forget also every Tuesday night is prayer in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. A great group of folks are coming out every Tuesday and praying for the needs of the church. And that happens every uh, Tuesday at 7. And everyone's welcome to be a part of that. Vacation Bible School is right around the corner June 9th to the 11th from 6 to 8 p.m. is Vacation Bible School here at the church. That'll be happening June 9th to the 11th from 6 to 8. Also... Uh, we're starting up small groups in the fall. We're going to be revamping some things, and small groups will be launched in the fall. And if you're interested in leading a small group, we've got re registration forms in the foyer. You can grab one of those, fill it out, and uh, you can help lead a small group that's going to be launched in the fall. And it's got more information on that. You can grab that, and you can turn it in uh, back to the front desk or to the office with the small groups, and that'll be great. And also on June the 14th is a father-son fishing tournament where you can bring uh, your son or uh, uh, maybe it's a, a boy that's precious to you. You can bring him out. A father-son fishing tournament on June the 14th. The women is going to provide the breakfast. And I think all you got to do is just show up, right? I'm looking for J.D. J.D. somewhere in here. All you got to do is just show up. I think the fishing poles is provided for you. You just got to show up and uh, just come fish, and it's just going to be great. June 14th, uh, father-son fishing tournament. Breakfast is going to be provided. The pole, fishing poles is here. You just got to show up and fish, and it's just going to be a great memory you can make. And also, right after service, uh, all the youth and the parents, uh, there will be a meeting after service uh, right here, right here in the front about the forward trip that's coming up in the month of June. Uh, that meeting will be right after service, and, and you can stay in... Uh, uh, meet with that just for a few moments, all youth and all parents uh, with the Ford trip. Uh, there'll be a meeting right after service uh, right down here down front. Well, I wonder, can anybody give God a praise for the opportunity to give on a Sunday morning to Him if you recognize He's blessed you with everything you have? You know, the Bible said that for God so loved the world that He gave. The truest aspect of love in its purest form is that it will cause you to give. When you really love, it will cause you to give. You know, and, and last, uh, I think it was about a month ago, but the Casey Leggett uh, felt impressed by the Lord, and he came up here, and, and he shared the dollar fifty a day campaign that we launched a little over about a month ago. Uh, Asking people, sharing the vision of where we're at and where we're headed, about the vision to build the youth center, the vision to see the children's center paid off in Jesus' name, and the vision for a future sanctuary one day in the near future. And, and he shared that, that if 400 people uh, would give $1.50 a day towards the campaign, this church would be totally debt-free in 12 months, and we could put those funds towards building the youth center. Could y'all give God a praise for that right there, 400 people? We could build the youth center together. 
And we, we've put about 13,000 into the youth center. We've got the foundation poured. The, it's all been done. It's poured. The drainage system is in. And so right now, folks have asked, well, Pastor, where we're at? We're at the point where we're waiting to raise the funds to purchase the metal uh, so we can put the actual building up for our youth. And, and the staff was getting the numbers together, and, I, and we said we're going to share with the church every month. We're going to share where we're at. So folks can know how many signed up, what we've raised. So the ch folks can know it. And they said, well, Pastor, are you sure you want the numbers? I said, whatever it is, we want it. And so right now, out of a church of about 400 strong, we got about 25 folks that have signed up and given consistently towards the dollar fifty day campaign. Now, you ought to give God a praise for the partial right there and just thank you for the 25. <laughs> praise the Lord. But... At the rate we're going, it will be two years before the youth center's up. But I'm believing in Jesus' name that God's going to move upon the hearts of the people to believe enough to sacrifice a Coke every day to build for our youth. Because the youth, the, the drug lords and the drug dealers is doing everything they can to win our teenagers. But Nehemiah shared the vision to rebuild the wall. And the scripture said that when he shared the vision, the people were so moved to give because they wanted to see that wall rebuilt. And I'm just believing that when we share this vision to build this youth center and continue to do more ministry, I'm believing, I'm just maybe crazy enough to believe, but I believe there's more than 25 people that says I'll sacrifice a coke every day so our teenagers can have a place not just to come have church but to come hang out on Friday nights and Saturday nights because I believe we got something better than the club I know nobody's going to help me right there but I believe we got something better and I believe it's worth giving to and so I want to challenge you to be a giver, to step up. If you haven't become a part of the Dollar 50 Day Campaign, I want to challenge you to consider to become a part, to help this vision become a reality. And if you're like me and you want to give and you say, Pastor, don't carry checks, I don't carry cash, we've got the giving kiosk in the foyer. You can give that way. And 100% of what you give goes towards ministry. And I just believe God's going to provide everything we need. Can somebody say amen? I'm telling you, preachers' hineys get real tight in the summer. Because people go on vacation, and most time when they go on vacation, they don't pay their tithes, but the bills keep coming. Can somebody say amen? But I'm just believing that there's a remnant of people at Turning Point that says, I'm not going to give up on giving to God. Whether I'm on vacation, I'm still going to give to Him. Praise the Lord. So I want to thank you for your faithfulness. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the opportunity to help see this vision become a reality. I thank you, Lord, for the 25 that have stepped up and are giving and pledged to be a part of this campaign. But I pray, Lord, that you will move upon the hearts of your people to continue to give, to see this vision become a reality, to make a difference in this community. And we'll give you praise for it. We'll give you all the glory for it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
this place right now. Just come on, ask God to wrap you this morning. Come on, come on, just worship Him this morning. Hey, come on, I long to be in His presence. I long to be in His arms this morning. Somebody worship Him this morning. the Lord. Anybody love you on this Sunday morning? If you got a Bible, turn me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and verse 23. Verses 22 and verse 23. I, I, I don't think I've ever done this before, but I, I, I shared from these scriptures on Wednesday night, and I really just couldn't get past them, and so I wanted to share with you I want to do a little bit of review just for those that may not have been here Wednesday. Then I just want to share a couple other things the Lord showed me um, from the fruit of the Spirit uh, in Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 22 and verse 23. This is what uh, the Scripture said. It said, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control and he said there was no law against these things. He said the Holy Spirit wants to produce fruit in your life. He has to get on the inside first. And once he gets on the inside, he's going to produce fruit on the outside. And he lists the fruit that the Lord, want, that the Spirit desires to see produce in every life of every believer. And so I want to speak to you just for a few minutes on this thought. I got it on the inside so you can see it on the outside. I got it on the inside so you can see it on the outside. Father, in Jesus' name, speak to us in these few moments of time together. I ask you, God, let us hear your voice. Lord, I thank you. You said the grass withers and the flower fades, but you said your word shall stand forever. Speak to us. God, put something down on the inside so we can see it on the outside. For it's in the wonderful name of Jesus we pray. And somebody said amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Paul was writing here in the book of Galatians, and he says, I want you to understand that when you become a believer in Jesus Christ, the Spirit comes into your life, and He desires to come into the inside, and He begins to change you from the inside out. He says, before you can see anything change on the outside, you first have to see a change on the inside. Before you can see the proper fruit bear on the outside, he says, I first have to deal with the root on the inside. You see, in a lot of times in churches, we have become so professional at pointing out the sins of people that we never deal with the iniquity of people. You see, sin is what you do, but iniquity is why you do what you do. And Jesus did not come just to change you from your sins, 
but he came to change you from the inside because he knew if he changed you on the inside that it would affect everything on the outside. That's why the Bible said that he came to lay the axe to the root because Jesus said if I can deal with the root on the inside of you, it will change the fruit on the outside of you. You see, I am so thankful that my Savior did not come just to change me on the outside, but he came to change me from the inside out. Because if you'd be honest with you, there's some struggles on the inside that your neighbor don't even know about. There's some issues on the inside that nobody knows about but you. But Jesus said, I'm coming on the inside to change you from the inside out because if you ever get changed on the inside, it will reflect on the outside. If you got peace on the inside, peace will come outside. If you got love inside, love will come on the outside. If you've got a praise on the inside, praise is going to show on the outside. You see, some folks think praise starts when you clap your hands. Some folks think praise starts when you open up your mouth and say, Lord, I bless you. Hallelujah. But I want to submit to you that praise doesn't start when you clap your hands. Praise doesn't start on the outside. A true praise, a pure praise, it starts down on the inside. It starts on the inside of a heart that says, I realize how blessed I am. I realize how forgiven I am. I realize how jacked up I used to be. But God's been faithful to me. God's forgiven me. I can't get no help on this Sunday morning. But is there anybody that has a praise on the inside of you today? So you got to realize that he wants to change you on the inside. Because if he changes you on the inside, it will show on the outside. And you've got to realize as a believer that when you were saved, the Holy Spirit came into your life and deposited the fruits of the Spirit inside of you in seed form. The, the ability to see the fruits of the Spirit is inside of every believer in seed form. But it's up to us to nurture the seed to see the seed become a harvest on the outside. But you got to understand, you don't have to do it by yourself. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 7, verses 5 and 6, he said, when you were controlled by the old nature, sinful desires were at work, catch this within us. And the law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds. But he said, now you've been released from the law, for we died to it and are no longer held captive to it by its power. We are not living in the old way, but we are now living in the new way according to the Spirit. You see, don't get it wrong. Don't get it confused, baby. I'm not living the way I'm living because of anything I've done. I'm not saved because of myself. I'm not delivered because of myself. I don't have it together because of myself. Y'all can sit there and act cute if you want to, but you didn't save yourself. You didn't deliver yourself. You didn't get yourself off the drugs. It was the Holy Spirit within you that created a new you inside of you and you ought to give God a praise right here and thank him for the Holy Spirit that set you free and changed you on the inside so you can see a change on the outside and catch this he says the Holy Spirit wants to change you and produce a fruit in your life and he starts naming the fruits that the Holy Spirit wants to produce in the life of every believer he said he wants to produce the fruit of love. He wants to produce the fruit of joy, the fruit of peace, the fruit of patience, the fruit of kindness. But catch this. He names the first fruit, and he says the first fruit the Holy Spirit wants to produce in your life is the fruit of love. Because love envelops all of the other fruits. Because you can never have kindness until you first have love. You can never really have patience until you have love. Because you have to understand that love is the cornerstone of every other fruit. It is the thing that envelops all of the other fruits. Because love is patient. Love is kind. 
If you have love, you're going to be patient. If you have love, you're going to be kind. He says the first love, the first fruit you've got to have in the life of the believer is you've got to have the fruit of love. But this isn't just any kind word of a love. You see, we say I love pizza and I love my wife. But I hope you love your wife more than you do your pizza. Can I get a witness in here? We say, I love fried chicken and I love my children. But I hope you love your children more than you do fried chicken unless they're on your last, last nerve. Can I get a witness in here? You see, we say love for everything. I love baseball. I love football. We have one word to describe love. But in the Greek language, there are five different words to describe five different levels of love. And in this text in Galatians chapter, to five. He says the Holy Spirit wants to produce a love inside of you. The word love is the word agape. It means a made up mind to love. It means an unconditional love. It means no matter what comes my way kind of love. And you see religious people can't handle what I'm about to tell you but I serve a God in John 3 16 that said for God so loved the world. For God so agape the world. He he had a made up mind to love you. He loved you before you ever got your life together. He loved you when you was in the club dropping it like it was hot. Ain't nobody gonna help me right here. He loved you when you was high. He loved you when you was drunk. He loved you when you didn't have it all together. He said I had a made up mind to love you before you ever joined the church and y'all I got to give God a praise right here because he loved me. He had an agape love for me. He loved me me even when I didn't have myself together and he says I want you to have this kind of love in your life I want you to have an agape love in you he says the spirit is going to produce an agape love an unconditional love, a made-up mind to love, a love that says no matter what comes my way, I'm going to love you. Even if you get on my last nerve, even if you disappoint me, I'm going to love you. And if there's one thing we need in our relationships, if there's one thing we need in our marriages, if there's one thing we need to baptize in the church again, we need a baptism of love. And you see, that's why the devil can't stand this church. That's why he's in the phone booth right now dialing 911 and having a Malox moment because he can't stand a church that operates in agape love because we're shouting it from the rooftops. I don't care how messed up you were. I don't care how drunk you are. I don't care if you walked in this church high as a kite. It doesn't matter your struggle. There is an agape love in this building. There is a God that loves you in spite of your weakness, in spite of your sin, in spite of what you struggle with. He loves you and some Somebody ought to get up and help me praise God today. If you're thankful, he loves you when you're living right. He loves you when you're living wrong. So he says the first fruit the Spirit wants to produce in your life, he wants to produce the fruit of love. The second fruit he says that he desires to see on display in every believer is the fruit of joy. You see, we confuse joy with happiness because for you to be happy, something has to happen. But joy doesn't focus on what's happening now. Joy focuses on what's coming. Joy focuses on a promise in the Lord. Joy says, my circumstances may not be good now, but God's going to work everything together for my good, for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You see, that's why the book said that the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You see, it doesn't matter what's around you. It doesn't matter the circumstances or the trouble that you may find yourself in. It doesn't matter the hurt or the pain. God says, I can provide a joy in you. 
that can get your eyes off of the pain of now and get your eyes on the promise of tomorrow. The Bible said that Jesus endured the pain of the cross for the joy that was set before him. I asked myself, how in the world could Jesus have joy knowing he was going to endure the pain of the cross? How can somebody have joy with spikes about to go through their hands? How can somebody have joy with spikes going through their feet and being beaten until they're almost unrecognizable? How can you have joy knowing you're about to endure that kind of pain? But Jesus said, you got to understand the reason why I could have joy in the midst of the pain is because I understood that behind my pain was a promise. Behind every pain is a promise. Behind every pain is a promise. Preacher, I don't believe it. You need to ask every mother in this room. Behind every pain is a promise. Behind the contractions is a... Ain't nobody going to help me right here. Behind the pain of birthing, there is a promise. Behind the morning sickness, there is a promise. Behind the contractions, ain't nobody going to help me in here. Behind the struggle, behind the tears, behind, behind the pain and the abandonment is a promise. And somebody in this room, I'm here to tell you under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, get your eyes off of the pain and get your eyes on the promise because God has a promise behind your pain. He can turn your mourning into dancing. Weeping may endure for the night, but your joy is coming in the morning because the joy of the Lord is your strength. It may not have went the way you wanted it to, but God says, I can turn this pain into a beautiful thing. Joy. Joy doesn't focus on the storms of now. It focuses on the rainbows of tomorrow. He says, I'm going to produce love in you. He says, the Holy Spirit's going to produce joy in you. You see, don't mix up joy with happiness. Because there's a lot of Christians that are joy suckers. Can I get a witness in here? You ain't praising God this Sunday... Because things didn't go how you want them to this week. I was thinking about it this week. We come in here. Beautiful place to worship. Our sins have been forgiven. We've eaten every meal this week. Some of us had six meals. Can I get a witness in here? We had a place to, we had a place to lay our head. The bills is paid. And we come in here and say, I ain't praising God because I ain't happy. We got to get our eyes off of happiness and get our joy back in the Lord. Yo, it ain't about what we got now. We got something to look forward to. We got a home in heaven. We got streets of gold. We got no more undertakers over there. There's no more sickness, no more dying, no more struggle, no more pain. We've got the joy of a home called heaven. And God help us not to mix up happiness with joy because we got some joy in this building. He says, I'm going to produce joy, then I'm going to produce peace. 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 God says, I want to put peace in you. You see, the Bible said that Jesus is the prince of peace. Jesus understood that what was in him could change what's around him. You see, peace is not circumstances being how you want them to do. Peace is when God gives you the ability to deal and change the circumstances you find yourself in. Peace is understanding that God is in control. I said God is in control. The one who holds the earth in the palm of his hands. The one that spins this earth on his axis and it never spins out of control. That same God who keeps the world from spinning out of control. Keeps your world in order and in peace. And all you've got to do is access the prince of peace. And say God put peace on the inside of me. And help me change the outside of what I'm in with the peace that is inside of me. Because I'm telling you, we are living in a day, if we're not careful, we think things is what's going to give us peace. 
We think if I get a bigger home, I'm going to have peace. If I get me a new car, I'm going to have peace. If I get my hair did, I'm going to have peace. If I get my toes did, I'm going to have peace. If I get me some Prada, I'm going to have peace. Peace cannot be found in the things of this world. The only time you're going to have peace is when you give your life to the Prince of Peace. We've had people in that office over there bawling their eyes out. They have millions upon millions of dollars. They have all the money you could ever imagine, but they have no peace. I know people that have big homes but have no peace. I know people that drive big cars and fancy cars but have no peace. You can take this world but give me Jesus. You can take the money, the silver, the gold, but as long as I got Jesus, I got my peace. I got my Prince of Peace. I don't care the storm that comes. I don't care the report of the doctor. I have the peace of the Lord. He is the Prince of Peace. And I dare you to give God some praise right here and say, send some peace to my home. Send some peace to my marriage. Send some peace over my babies. Send some peace over my career. Don't care what it looks like. I got the Prince of Peace. And he's in control. He said he's going to put peace in you. And then he said he wants to produce patience. Tap your neighbor and say, hold on. This is going to hurt. He wants to produce patience. You see, we live in a culture today where if Chick-fil-A don't get us our chicken sandwich in 29.53 seconds, we want to see the manager talk to the president because we want a free apple pie. Can I get a witness in here? Because we are in patience. We can have lunch in California and be home by dinner. We are a fast society that is controlled by time. And we take our lives that are controlled by time and we try to put God in a box who is an eternal God and say, God, you must move according to my time. You have to understand that God is an eternal time, God who is not bound by the time on the clock. He will move when he gets ready to because he is the author and the finisher of your faith. You see, the only reason God created time was so how you could keep up with how good he's been to you. The only reason he created time was so you could keep up how he blessed you, how he put food on the table, how you could say in 2001 he set me free, 2004. He protected my babies. 2005, he, he put my marriage back together. 2006, he healed what doctors said. Could not, ain't nobody gonna help me up in this room. But I wonder, is there anybody in this room that can look back over the time of your life and say, ah, he's been mighty good to me. He's been mighty faithful to me. The ancient of days, the ruler, he's been faithful. And I've got to give him a praise right here for every time he's been faithful. For every time he's an eternal God. I'm about to run. Somebody give God some of your time right here and bless his name. Say, I'm going to give you 60 seconds to thank you for that. God says you got to have patience and trust me with your time and know that I am the author and the finisher. He's not just the author of your life. He is the finisher. That's why he said in Jeremiah 29, 11, I have an expected end for you. He says, I've already planned out the end of your life. I have an expectation of where I'm going to get you to. And if you will trust me, if you will let me guide you, if you will let me lead you, I'm going to get you to something beautiful. I'm going to get you to something amazing. Paul said, your eye has not seen, your ear has not heard, and it has not entered into your heart the thing that God wants to bless you with, but you've got to trust him and be patient. Because you see, impatience comes when God doesn't do what we want Him to when we want Him to do it. And we see this all throughout the Bible of people that struggled with patience. Mary and Martha had a brother who was sick by the name of Lazarus. 
And the Bible said that they were asking for Jesus to come and Jesus didn't show up. And they got impatient. They got mad because you will always get frustrated when your expectations are not realized according to your timetable. They were frustrated with Jesus. And Jesus shows up in their eyes too late. They said, you've showed up too late. We needed you to heal Lazarus. Now he's dead. He's in the grave. You've showed up too late. You didn't show up in time. But Jesus said, Mary and Martha, you got to realize, you've got to learn patience because you wanted me to just come heal Lazarus, but I was coming to give you something bigger and better. I was coming to give you something better than what you was asking me for. You was asking me to heal Lazarus, but I'm going to raise this joker from the dead. I'm going to do something bigger and better than you could ever imagine. And some of you are getting frustrated with God because you're saying, God you didn't give me what I wanted when you were supposed to give it to me and the word of the Lord to you this Sunday is hold on because it's bigger and better than you could ever imagine I said it's bigger and better than you could ever imagine you've just got to trust the Lord and be patient be patient because the right gift at the wrong time is a disaster. The right gift at the right time is a miracle. I said the wrong gift. You can give somebody the right gift at the wrong time and it can be a disaster. Preacher, what do you mean? It is wrong to give your two-year-old a motorcycle. Can I get a witness of here? It is wrong to give your toddler the keys to your car and say, go to Walmart, get me some Texas Pete and some Raymond noodles and come back to the house. That is a disaster to waiting to happen. And some of y'all do that. I'm praying for you right now. The right gift at the wrong time is a disaster waiting to happen. If you don't have what he wants to give you yet, it's because either you're not ready for the miracle or the miracle is bigger and better than you could ever imagine. But you got to trust him, get your eyes off of happiness and access the joy of the Lord and say he's got something better. I've told this story before, but I feel led to share it today. I can remember when my grandparents died in front of where the Walmart red light is today. Now I can remember going into the hospital room and praying for my grandmother. She was a Pentecostal lady. She, I mean, the water could boil and she kicked out of behind. I mean, she just had it in her son. She was fired up, Lord. And I can remember going in there, the accident, I was praying and believing, saying, God, you said by your word you'd heal them. You said by your word you could heal her. I command in the name of Jesus to heal her. She didn't get healed. She died. And I was angry with God. I was mad with God. God, you didn't move when I told you to move. It's too late. And I'll never forget it. God spoke to me and said, Justin, I healed her. I just didn't heal her the way you thought I was going to heal her. You thought I was going to heal her on this side, but she stepped into a place called heaven. She's more healed than she's ever been before. She's gone. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, you ought to give your God a praise. He might not have healed it the way you thought he should do it, but it's bigger and better. I'm closing the last fruit I want to deal with he said I'm going to produce the fruit of love joy, peace, patience, kindness goodness, faithfulness, gentleness he says but the last thing the spirit wants to produce in the life of every believer is self control this is going to hurt he says he wants to give you the ability to control yourself on the inside. Because you see, some of us can control ourselves as long as things on the outside are the way we want them to. But God wants to get you to a place when even things around you aren't going the way you want them to and you can't control the outside. You still have control of yourself on the inside. 
Because if the truth be told, the biggest enemy you face is not the devil. He's already been defeated. Jesus went and took the keys to death, hell, and the grave. He don't even have the keys to his own crib. We give him too much credit. Your biggest enemy is not your boss, it's not your wife or your husband. Look straight, don't look beside him. The biggest enemy is in me, in you. It's when you lose self-control in you. It's when things don't go the way you want them to and you fly off at the handle and shoot birds in traffic. You praising God one minute, speaking in tongues, and somebody cuts you off in traffic, taking the kids to school, and you shooting birds all up in that place. Telling the cashier off because she didn't do what you want her to do. Losing self-control. But Jesus says, I want to produce a fruit in you where you can even control your reaction to things outside of you. Where what's in you is not affected by what's around you. But you affect what's around you with what's in you. Because I, I, I've been doing a little work around the house here lately. And I am not a carpenter by any means. You put a hammer in my hand, it's a weapon of mass destruction. Can I get a witness in here? It is a weapon of mass destruction in my hand. I had a hammer the other day and I was trying to fix something around the house and I had this little thing called a nail. And I put the nail between my two fingers and I was aiming for the nail, but I hit my finger instead. And before Jesus, I would have said, shig em, dig em, frig em. Can I get a witness in here? You can edit that for your version. But when I hit my finger... Shig em, freak em, dig em didn't come out. I started saying, oh, hallelujah. I bless you, Jesus. This hurts, but I need you right now, Jesus. You see, in spite of the pain, in spite of the mistake, in spite of the failure, I didn't let what was outside of me affect what was inside of me by losing my self-control. And I'm telling you that even when things don't go the way you want them to, even when people don't do what you want them to do, God says you can't lose self-control. you got to control yourself. It's hard to clap right here because I'm preaching everybody in the room. But we got to control ourselves. I was listening to somebody the other day. They was telling somebody off, give them a piece of their mind. They said, I won that battle. I didn't say nothing, but I'm thinking, no, you lost the battle. You lost the battle in you. Because sometimes the strongest thing you can do is not say anything and control yourself. Come on, give God a praise if you want to see the fruits of the Spirit in your life. Anybody want to see some love? Anybody need some joy? Anybody need some peace? Anybody need some self-control? God, help me control my mouth. Help me control my mind. Help me control my actions. Come on, if you're real radical, could you raise your hand right here? Could you say, Lord, produce love in my life. Produce unconditional love in my marriage, with my children, with my church. Give me peace. Give me joy. No matter what's around me, give me joy. Give me self-control. Help me to control me. Even when I can't control what's around me, give me self-control. Self-control. Every head bowed, every eye closed in this room. If you're in this place, you'd say, Pastor, I'm not where I need to be with the Lord. Because before you can ever have this fruit, you got to have the right root. Before you can really have love, you have to receive love. Before you can give love, you have to have received love. Before you can give peace, you got to receive the Prince of Peace. If you're in this place and say, Pastor, I'm not where I need to be with the Lord. I need to get some things right. I need to accept Him as my Savior. i got to get some sin under the blood. If that's you in this room, 
I want you to get out of that chair right now. I want you to meet me at this altar. I just want to lead you in a prayer. I'm not going to judge you, look down on you, but I want to lead you in a prayer. I want you to receive love today. If you need to receive love, if you need to receive peace, come on, can you give God a hand clap? They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. I got to get some things right. I got to get some things right. I got to get some things on the blood. I need some peace. I need some joy. Can I get a couple guys to help me with these guys right here? I need his joy and his peace and his love. I gotta change the root so I can have the right fruit. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. When they won this room, put your hand on your heart. Pray this prayer with me. Say it loud, say it proud. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I admit I got some ugly roots. But I believe you died for me. I believe you shed your blood for me. I ask you to wash this heart. Give me a brand new start. I confess you as my Savior. Help change me on the inside. So I can change the fruit on the outside. Give me love. Give me peace. Give them joy. Give them self-control. Kindness. Faithfulness. Come on, if you need one of the fruits of the spirits, could you raise your hand right here? Whatever fruit you need, just say, Lord, give it to me. Give me faithfulness. Give me peace. Give me joy. Remind me there's purpose, promise behind the pain. Give me peace. Give me joy. Lord, baptize your people in love. Baptize every marriage in love. Peace, joy. I bless them today. God, change us on the inside so we can bear the right fruit on the outside. Let the fruit of the spirits be abundant in our lives. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Can you help me give God one more big hand clap of praise today?